Is this, is this on? Is it working? Okay, cool. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we here at the Digital Life Initiative are very excited to be here and to be sharing our work with you and to be taking your questions, um, both ones that you submitted ahead of time, and hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, I'd like to introduce myself very quickly. My name is N.C. Farrell. Uh, I am a presidential postdoctoral scholar here at Cornell Tech and a visiting researcher uh, at DLI. Um, and I'd like to quickly introduce each of our panelists. Uh, this is Professor Helen Nissenbaum. Uh, she's the director of the Digital Life Initiative. Um, next to her is Lee McGuigan, um, who is also a DLI fellow, uh, as well as Noah Moore, who is a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Law at the University of Haifa and also a DLI fellow. And then finally, Yael Eisenstadt, who is a visiting fellow at DLI. Um, I'd like each to give each of them a few minutes to give them uh, give you guys some background on DLI um, and on their work here, and I'll, I'll start with Helen. Hi, um, Helen Nissenbaum, professor at Cornell Tech in the Information Science Department, and I'm really privileged to be the director of DLI, which is the Digital Life Initiative, and thank you for serving as our moderator. Um, also delighted to see you all here to come out on this freezing cold night and learn a little bit about what we do. As you all know, and I'm sure you've been living with Cornell Tech, the Cornell Tech experience and all the excitement around Cornell Tech being tech innovation and leading edge tech and AI and all the exciting things that we're doing, starting new companies and um, impacting people's lives in, in every way. We, and that's all great. And what we know about digital technologies, information technologies, computers and computation is that it has in fact entered and affected pretty much every aspect of our lives. It could be in the workplace, which looks very different from the way it might have looked a few decades ago. Family life, how many of us um, operate families that are spread all over the country, all over the city, all over the world, using social media, and perhaps we have smart devices in our homes Certainly we're using our mobile phones and so on. So it, it affects every aspect of life. And so it's very exciting. Lots of millionaires and and every you know every new gadget that we read about. But one of the issues that concerns those of us who and, and this was what actually compelled me to come to Cornell Tech in the first place was what about our values? What about ethical societal values. What is this going to do to politics? And I think we're experiencing some of that today. How are these technologies, as exciting and buzzy and money producing that they are, how are they going to affect the quality of our lives? How are they going to affect the quality of individual lives and how are they going to affect community life? How are they going to affect societies and nations. And that's what is behind the creation of the Digital Life Initiative. Ethics, politics, quality of life. We bring together folks, outstanding young <coughs> scholars, activists, advocates who spend time at Cornell Tech, living within Cornell Tech, working with technologists, but also developing and and promoting in a rigorous way the ideas behind ethics, politics, quality of life as they affect digital societies. That's what we do. We also hold public events, and I hope that you'll be able to keep track of the events that we hold. And to those events, you're more than welcome to attend and participate. We have workshops, we have conferences, and we produce writings, we intervene in public issues and we help people think about the impacts on their lives and also push back when we think that some of those impacts are problematic. That's what we do, that we're 
that's what we're going to do. That's part of what the discussion is tonight. Um, we're just delighted that you came to join us for this discussion and we hope it won't be the last. <coughs> <clears throat> I'm sorry to say that I'm getting over a cough, and so um, I don't have much of a voice, so I'm going to keep this a little briefer than I might. Maybe that's mm -hmm. everyone's benefit. We need a little bit of volume, a little bit stronger. We cannot hear. I yeah. can hear well the lady said. We need a little bit stronger. We are not your age, so uh -huh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about the, the volume of the speakers. Nobody hear the pulse of wisdom that just came out of your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to hold the mic. Okay. 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 Is that any better? Oh, yeah. This is about all the voice I have right now, yeah. so I, I'm sorry. Um, so my name's Lee, I'm a researcher here. I come from Canada originally, and I spent the last six years at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia studying communication. Now I come here, um, my research looks at a range of issues related to digital technologies and the ways that they affect our cultural and economic lives. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the way that corporations, and especially corporations involved in advertising and marketing, try to shape new media systems and technologies in ways that reflect their values and priorities. So in particular, I'm trying to, I, my work charts the history of how it is the case today that almost everywhere we go, and almost every environment we inhabit without devices or otherwise, uh, companies are keeping track of us. They're generating information about all the things that we do, and increasingly things like the moods and emotions that we express, um, where we travel in space, and all that sort of stuff, um, and use that to try and target us with advertisements or marketing appeals, or to sell the data to other companies who are interested in that sort of thing. Um, this is probably an issue that you've heard about in the news lately, I know it's a big topic, um, but it really, my view is that the whole history of advertising is one of trying to incorporate the technology, the information and the information technologies that are available to these companies to try and do these sorts of things, to get more information about people so that you can predict and influence their behaviors more reliably. Um, and really it's a history about trying to discriminate more precisely. And that's not just, not necessarily, it's, you know, like a hostile action if we're gonna discriminate against people of particular characteristics, even though that is the way that it manifests. But it's um, a systematic drive to try and get, make finer and finer guesses and bets about how to make two pennies instead of one. And the results of that are affecting our lives in lots of ways, shaping the technologies and the media environments that we use and inhabit. Um, in ways that I think we're starting to recognize the dark side of it today. And the point that I want to drive home is that it's not just the problem of Facebook and Google and these companies that we hear about today, but it's really about the business model of trying to monetize attention and predict and influence behavior that has always been at the core of a media system that is articulated to a marketing system that requires lots of pervasive surveillance of the things that people do, what we buy, how we might act and respond to certain sorts of things. So, um, on that happy note, I'll pass it. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a presentation? I think you guys are looking into this. Um, <laughs> 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 I'd like to use the, the microphone. Is that okay? No. <laughs> um, so my research deals with um, social network sites like Facebook and Twitter. Um, you may know them um, by the name social uh, network, uh, social media networks, or um, social um, network platforms. Um, and in my research, I examined the emergence of these, uh, of these platforms as arenas for crafting and allocating um, human rights. Um, and what I believe is happening is that um, this immense influence that these platforms have over um, our human rights, their ability to manage our human rights, um, is actually a stress, is actually highlights the public attitude of these uh, platforms that justify the application of. Uh, uh, public law norms to them. Um, public attributes are, are 
characteristic that sometimes are um, often ascribed to um, state actors. Um, and, and topical norms are, are standards such as proportionality, ease of living, um, and uh, reasonability that are usually ascribed to states and state actors in order to, to um, guide their um, discretion and make sure that the enormous power that they have is not being um, abused. So the emergence of social network sites as arenas for crafting human rights are revised, I think, on two dimensions. The first relates to the wide range of human rights that is being uh, influenced by social network sites, and the other relates to the various practices of control that are being carried out by these platforms and that influence this wide range um, of human rights. So starting with the first dimension, um, while it is very common to hear about the right of privacy and freedom of expression in the context of social network sites, um, the truth is that these platforms uh, influence a much wider range of human rights and actually also the recognized um, categories of, of rights. They influence civil and political rights, which include, except for freedom of expression and, and privacy, also um, freedom of religion, freedom of demonstration and assembly, and rights to vote and to be elected. And they also um, influence additional rights, as um, um, economic, social, and cultural rights, like the rights to um, education, the right to culture, and various employee rights, like um, the rights to strike. And the ability of social network sites to influence such a wide range of human rights um, is connected, I think, to the uh, powerful social dynamics that flourish throughout these sites and that um, stem from their important role as a means to support relationships. Um, a role that distinguishes a social network sites from other uh, social media platforms, such as uh, joint projects as uh, Wikipedia or other blogs. Um, and these social dynamics, dynamics are fascinating. They're, um, they rely upon various uh, factors, such as um, the special way in which we groom and cultivate relationships, um, the social capital that, that is exchanged um, when, it, when interpersonal interactions uh, occur, um, processes of reciprocity, and various and the role that uh, strong and weak ties has um, has in our uh, networks. And these social dynamics. Uh, create two types of resources, informational resources and, and social communal uh, resources that are responsible um, to a great extent to our ability to exercise our rights in these um, arenas. And so the second dimension relates to the various practices of control that are being carried out by these platforms um, and that influence that wider range of human rights that we've just seen. And, and in my research, I've chosen to uh, focus on five of them. Um, surveillance, which relates to the ubiquitous, non-stop uh, processes of collecting and documenting uh, personal information. Profiling, which is the sorting and classifying um, of, of information for targeted ads uh, use, but also for other purposes like just personalizing the information or the non-commercial information that will, that will be exposed to. Censorship, which has become more and more um, sophisticated and relies upon various uh, incentives. Um, nexus with authorities uh, includes sharing information with authority, um, restricting access to information upon authority requests, and the whole important realm, which is related to the fact that officials and public servants are also social network sites um, users. Um, and finally, expulsion of individuals and communities by disabling or suspending accounts uh, pages and uh, groups. Um, and each one of these practices influence the, the wide range of human rights that we've just seen in a different manner and volume, uh, but oftentimes it is done by determining the scope of the information on social resources that we've just seen. Um, and it's also important to know that the wide implementation of artificial intelligence throughout social network sites um, enables social network sites to further magnify, intensify the control that they've gained by incorporating these uh, practices. And what I think is happening is that by com when, when these two dimensions are uh, put together, um, they create these sophisticated arenas in which human rights are being crafted um, and designed. And this, I think, echoes the way that the state uh, manages um, human rights, maybe the most principal and traditional um, task of the state. It's just that in the case of the state, there are designated mechanisms in place to make sure that this enormous power is not being abused, but rather 
realized uh, in concert with uh, human rights that unfortunately there is not a place uh, with uh, such an emphasis. And what I think we should do is see this selling, this enormous uh, influence over human rights as a selling type of argument that justifies application of public law norms to these platforms, um, the requirements that they should follow, uh, such as proportionality, reasonability, when they're giving a due process. Um, and I believe that this might lead to more user user-centered decision-making processes that are more desirable, balanced, and level-headed, um, and just more responsible from uh, the user's um, standpoint. Uh, this might lead to more transparency and accountability on uh, social network sites part. And we should also remember that these norms are flexible, um, they're not rigid or detailed, so they will, they're adjustable to change the environment of technology. They also be placed for some um, legitimate interest of um, the social network sites themselves. Um, and, and finally, it, I think it will also allow us to empower users, um, enable them to crystallize their expectations of being millionaires um, in these platforms, and maybe assist them in being more informed and involved in protecting their uh, rights and these um, rights. and civil discourse and democracy. Uh, I come at it from more of a practitioner than an academic background. I spent most of my career in government in the national security world, uh, in the intelligence world, and then as a diplomat, spent a lot of my career overseas. And then I was one of the national security advisors at the White House in 2009, 2010. Uh, most recently, so I left government in 2013, and uh, started exploring what, especially in the last few years, the breakdown of civil discourse in the United States. Not that we haven't always had issues with civil discourse, but I started looking at what was it that was, in my opinion anyway, seeming to be exacerbating uh, this even more, and started digging in particularly on social media and some of the things, for example, that he was talking about were the the business models of what, I won't get into when we talk about business models, but what, what is it that's inherently baked into these business models that's creating a situation where we don't even know how to talk to each other anymore? So that's sort of on a broad level. From there, as I started speaking out on these topics, Facebook called. So I went into Facebook as their head of global elections integrity, um, for political advertising, which I'm sure some of you have seen in the news recently. Um, I only stayed six months, so that probably tells you where my opinions come from on what they are doing about it. So uh, now the few goals for this year, I mean, the long-term goal for me is to help ensure that government and the tech industry figure out how to work together to help safeguard democracy. The short-term goal is to really dig into some of these issues we still have ahead of the 2020 elections and see if there are any shorter-term things we can do to help ensure that we have as much of a free and fair election as one could have. I'm, I'm not too optimistic about it. It depends on how you define free and fair election. Um, so some of that includes you know, some of the debates you've heard about how political advertising should work online. Some of that has to do with what I would call, and many would call, weaponization of social media, disinformation campaigns, all of that. But I think what I'll do now is just leave it for Q and A, as opposed to giving a long speech about all my opinions. Okay. So, um, as you guys can see, and this is just a, a small taste of the expertise um, at DLI, but we have experts across the issues of privacy, um, advertising, human rights, uh, political uh, advertising online, social networks. So it's a, it's a broad range of topics that we cover here at DLI. Um, and Thankfully, you guys brought a broad range of concerns to uh, to this event. I, I want to thank everybody who took the time 
to fill out the form ahead of time with your questions. It was really useful in helping us um, put this together. So I'm gonna start with some of the questions that we received through that form and see where that takes this conversation and then we can go to a Q&A with you guys live after those questions. Um, but I, I do wanna give due to the, the questions we received ahead of time. Um, and it seemed like I, I noticed a lot of people resonating with that particular question about the 2020 elections. And so I wanna kick it to our panel, um, not anyone in particular because so, much, so many of our expertises overlap. Uh, but we did receive a, a few questions about political advertising um, and how it's been in the news. Uh, and some people were asking simply, why is it important? Why are we talking so much about this in the news? And so I, I wanna put that to our panel. <coughs> I'll be happy to kick off on this one since this, this is uh, sort of my bread and butter. Um, so right, there's been a lot of talk in the news lately. For those of you who have followed the, the debacle that really flared up after an ad was run on Facebook by the Trump campaign, which showed um, a debunked claim that Joe Biden had called Ukraine and it, the, the whole ad in and of itself was debunked. And so it launched this debate whether or not people should be able to lie in ads and what the social media platform should do about this. Um, this in and of itself is not a debate we're gonna solve tonight. It's, it's, it's an ongoing debate. Um, this is gonna sound like a plug for myself. I've written quite a bit about it. So, I mean, if you really wanna dig in, uh, on the DLI, DLI website, you'll find my name and you can see some of the articles I've written about it. But, in a nutshell, the, the regulations and protections, and, and Lee can probably speak to some of this better, uh, as well, if not better than I can, that has generally been the guardrails around how advertising has worked in more traditional media forms in the past, a lot, that, that hasn't translated into the digital world. So a lot of these questions about what the rule should be for advertising in social media are still being decided. Um, I do think some of the broader conversations are things that we as a society are going to have to figure out, particularly the debate around freedom of speech versus censorship. So I will just give a quick nutshell of what I personally think about the Facebook debacle that happened a month ago now. Um, when you are taking money for advertising, and this is my personal opinion, when, you, when your platform is profiting off of not just the ads, but the, the whole reason why those ads are so potent is because of the way these social media platforms can target individuals with different information. Because of the way that their entire business model works, which is predicated on gathering as much data and information as they can about all of us, whether that be because you're looking at Facebook or because they're actually able to track some of your other use around the internet, including what other websites you're clicking on, where you're shopping, things like that. They're able to put together a profile on you, and that profile is a personality profile, you fit into certain buckets, and then when, an, when a political advertiser wants to advertise to you, traditionally they would have to, let's say on network news or even cable news, they could target you by location. They could have different ads run in different markets, but they couldn't get a specific as, I want this ad to be shown to women of this certain age who have this certain political leaning, who look like they might be voting for this person. I mean, the specifics, and I won't get into all the details on how targeting works, but it means that you and you might live near each other, but the two of you might be served completely different ads. And if that's the case, then we're not coming from the same starting point. We're not, we don't even have the beginning starting point of where does this conversation begin because we're each being shown different things. So for me, the, the, the big question, the big debacle around whether or not uh, politicians should be allowed to lie in ads, again, that is a bigger debate about how you feel about freedom of speech versus paid advertising. My bigger concern is the way we are able to be targeted with those ads. And if we allow unchecked lying and political advertising to be hyper-targeted to us, there is no way that's an even playing field for 
what a democracy means in order to thrive. So that's my as high level as I can get. I can say a little bit about that. <clears throat> I think those were great points. And it's interesting to compare it to the way that other media have been regulated with respect to political advertising. So what Facebook basically did is adopt the same position that broadcast stations used to adopt, which was, we're not gonna, you know, we'll take whatever political ads you give us, we're not gonna edit them, we're gonna show them. We're a common carrier because the rationale signed by the FCC is that the broadcast spectrum, the airwaves through which you're delivered the television or radio signals is a public resource. And because it's a public resource, broadcast stations don't enjoy the same sorts of First Amendment privileges that newspapers do. There are certain checks and responsibilities that are put on them. And so they had to run everything. But the, 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 the check on that, if they were to air an advertisement that lied, was that everybody in that market saw the lie. And the next day, Everybody, all the constituency constituents could call the political offices and say, this is false. A candidate could run an advertisement saying that advertisement is false. On Facebook, because of the sorts of targeting that Yale just described, not only will different people not see the same ads, but it might be that no one ever has any awareness of an ad that's, that's shown to just a very small group of people. And so you get political advertisements that can be more dishonest, more outrageous, in a way that if you saw them on broadcast television and you were, you were sending some of these messages to a wide swath of the population, people would be outraged. Like many people would say, this is distasteful, it's bad, it's, it goes against our values and so on. And so I think there needs to be some reconciling of the profound differences in the way these messages are delivered and thus the sorts of responsibilities that the social media companies bear in light of that. Yeah, I, I, will, I think these are, these are precisely the points that are important to make. Generally speaking, digital technologies in the past, we, they boasted about this idea of personalization, as if this is not mass broadcast, or um, we're not going to give you medication just for someone who has a flu or who has cancer. No, we're going to personalize your treatment very, very specifically targeted to you and who you are, and always presenting this as if it's a feature and it's something that we all feel, oh, we're so special because we're treated as individuals. But what you've just heard is that there's a difference between receiving medication that is perhaps personalized to your particular genetic makeup and the diseases, um, some of the genetic makeup of the specific diseases, and also the, mes the, the political messages that you're getting that are personalized to you in a way that actually could be quite manipulative. And so what's sad about what's been happening is that we often, we often would see the same thing turn to each other and say, well, what do you think about that? But as we've just heard, that civil discourse that allows us to talk with our neighbors and argue and disagree is not, we're being deprived of that. And this concept of personalization, which has been considered as a strength of digital technology, is now being weaponized against not only individuals, but rather some of the societal values that we hold dear. Well, uh, <laughs> with that heavy start, um, this actually makes me think of another set of questions we've received, thinking about targeted advertising um, and moving away from the political realm and thinking about targeted advertising as a, as a concern of its own. Um, there were a lot of questions that we received about being tracked online, um, how our information is getting used to target us for advertisements or how it's getting used in ways that are, are maybe more invisible to us as we move about online. Um, and so I was wondering if our panelists could speak to maybe some of the different ways that our information can be taken and used online and maybe briefly on some ways that we can protect ourselves. And I, I'm going to ask that question with the caveat that we're also going to, we also have resources to share with you guys that you can take home 
um, not printed resources, but like uh, online resources we can share with you if this is a concern of yours. So we'll be giving some advice here on the stage today, but if you have these concerns, please come up to us and talk to us afterwards and we can share these resources. my personal information could be taken and used online, how can I protect myself? Yes. Um, so I'm going to tackle a little bit of that question because this whole row of us um, knows quite a lot about this field. Wherever you go online, you're being tracked. And it's not that you're only being tracked. Let's say you go to the New York Times. It's not only that the New York Times is tracking you and knows what stories you've read or when you logged on and so on, but um, every ad and even tiny invisible pixels on the screen may not be coming from the New York Times. They could be coming from other places. And so there are, <laughs> yes, so um, I'm trying to think that we how in the weeds, weeds, how in the weeds we want to go. So you can show them like the field of weeds and then we can, for specific weeds, come speak okay. to us afterwards. So, so this, because I'm so into this, I could talk for hours about this and I, I, I want to find the right level or the right way to describe what's going on. Whenever you go to a website, you would see, um, and I have to say something a little bit strange, and you might find this humorous, but a website that is, the two websites I can recommend to you, one is Alcoholics Anonymous, and the other one is Wikipedia. So these are websites that do not, last I looked, track you. But most other websites not only are tracking you, but they have parts of the web page that actually are not coming from the website that you're visiting. They're coming from third parties that we don't even know about. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands of third parties that are utilizing your visit to Forbes magazine, for example, to know that you've gone to Forbes magazine or New York Times and track you across the many places that you go. And by observing where you're going, these third parties who create the profiles that um, we've already discussed, and they may manipulate you in various ways. They may provide you with ads that they know you're vulnerable to. They may provide you with political ads. And that's all because of this tracking that's going on, the surveillance that's going on every time you visit a website on the web. Now, one of the, one of the um, discoveries that has been made a little bit more recently is something called dark patterns, where social scientists have discovered ways that people are vulnerable to various kinds of sales pitches, and again, make people visiting websites more vulnerable to certain kinds of manipulations. So the question about what we can do about this, there's some things we can do about this, but I think Yael is gonna tell us really what will have an impact, there are ways we can protect ourselves. And one of the most important ways to protect ourselves against some of what's going on is precisely what we're doing today, which is people becoming more engaged, more knowledgeable. And then there are small things that we can do that make us you know, not sitting ducks, but then there are bigger things that people empowered with knowledge and information will be able to do. So, um, just to follow up on that, I think that in, ter I think that in terms of uh, what are 
different types of trainings that are going on. I think it's beneficial um, to maybe start with looking at the actors. And I think, um, so one, one major actor are, um, are the websites themselves, especially major dominant uh, websites or platforms. Um, and, and one of their interests is trying to track and understand you as, as much as possible in order to make you more engaged, um, meaning uh, personalizing the information that will be introduced uh, to you. So you would have incentives to keep on spending time, um, liking posts, retweeting them, sharing them. So the whole cycle uh, kicks you on. So this is one uh, major actor. And then there's the advertisers who have interest on you clicking on ads and um, uh, purchasing th um, products and services through their um, through these ads. And there are additional um, employee stakeholders there. There's the data brokers, which is their job is just to aggregate as, as much as, as, as possible data about you and to sell it to different um, um, actors. Um, and there's also uh, authorities involved in this whole uh, ecosystem. Um, and just um, one little addition to the how to protect yourself. I think one of the things that we should do is just try to to go to the to the um, settings. This is one of the things we should do. I know it's a little bit overwhelming at first. We should go to the settings because usually the the, the default settings are not set uh, in a way that serves our uh, interest. We should go there and try to to change uh, the settings so it would. Um, allow us a little bit more control of what's going on with our data. Um, you can, if you just do a little search, you might uh, find some uh, very accessible uh, resources to help you how to, to do that. Um, there's, um, you can uh, change the settings of the browsers and, and of your um, devices. And, and like Helen said, I think one of the most important things is just, just insisting on being involved uh, and informed, and there are so many uh, resources. We have our podcast, uh, Open Your Eye, um, but many, many other resources that are available and, and accessible for free. Um, and I think that we just have to insist on being in this cycle of uh, decision making. Very true. One thing to, to add, maybe, too, is to consider that not only we track online, but we track in almost all of the activities we do as citizens and consumers, not almost, but, but very many of them. So for example, when you use a credit card, when you buy and register an automobile, when you get insurance, when you subscribe to a magazine, companies and parts of government are collecting the data about this for legitimate reasons often, because they want to serve you better, um, or they need to keep registries for particular reasons that have to do with things that I think we could think are, or we could agree are quite reasonable. What's interesting though, and troubling about the digital advertising space is that as uh, Noah mentioned, there are these data aggregator companies, companies we may or may not have heard of, like Axiom or Experion, a credit uh, rating agency, companies like this that uh, take data from all these different places, from the DMV, from magazine publishers, and they bring it all together into this pool. Because some of it's available publicly, like that you own a home, for example, things like that, that they can bring together and create a picture of you and of what you might be worth. Because the way that the sort of money flows is that there are advertisers who are interested in influencing you. And they want to do that as cost effectively as they can. And so the starting point for that is that they want to know as much about you as they can so that they're targeting the right people with their advertisements. If they sell dog food, they don't want to target people who own cats, right? This is the classic example of waste that they're trying to eliminate. But they also want to know that their advertisements worked. And they want to know that they ran in the way that they paid for. So the publishers and companies on the other side are also tracking the places we go so that they can know how big was the audience that saw this advertisement. It was the right price paid and all of that. So the point is that there's a sort of systematic imperative towards collecting lots of information about us. Um, the way this looks in practice on the web, for example, is using a technology called a cookie. Have you, have you heard of a web cookie before? Yes, yes. Okay. So the interesting thing about the cookie is that it's actually on its way out, <laughs> probably. Um, it's been made like quasi-illegal by the European Union's 
data rules and by the data laws passed in California recently. Um, and so it still persists. This, so to, if, for, if you don't know, a cookie is basically a piece of software that a website installs on your computer that acts as a persistent identifier for your device so that, that, a, so that you can be tracked across different websites. Um, the, uh, the reason for it was actually for, for online shopping carts so that if you put a pair of shoes in your shopping cart, you could go back and keep shopping and those shoes wouldn't disappear from your shopping cart. So it's actually a reason that people probably think it makes sense. But, it all comes out of so the question is what's going to happen next? If the cookie goes away, and the cookie is the basis for a huge proportion of the behavioral advertising that exists right now. Behavioral advertising meaning advertising that's targeted based on records of your behavior. What's going to happen next? And some of the, the proposals that companies and advertising organizations are floating are much scarier. They're like these personal fingerprints um, that are going to be persistent not only as you browse the internet, but across the different devices you use. So there are ways that companies can assign a, a unique identifier to you based on your, let's take your cell phone for example. Most people here have smartphones increasingly and by not looking not only at the places you go and where you access the internet, but the apps that you have. Um, there are even like weird things like different settings that you have on your phone that create a unique identifier that's it's just your own and different from every other cell phone based on these tiny little things. Now, industry will say that that's not personally identifiable information because it's not necessarily tied to your name and address. Um, I'm not convinced that it's more important to have a name. Like, I'm not sure it really matters if you're known by your name or if you're owned by a numeric identifier. The point is that we understand how you, uh, you know, act um, and to be there. Um, and the apps are a place, uh, if you use apps on your phone, that's a great place to try and, um, do you want to say something? Oh, no, just that, now I'm kind of scared. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm wondering if, if Gail could maybe, if we can shuttle it over to Gail so she can give us some like ways to go from here. And just in the interest of getting some more of the questions in, sorry. I was just going to say how to protect yourself with the app. <laughs> every, probably, just about every app you have probably has, as a default, access to your microphone, to your pictures, to your address book, to your track your location. Go into the settings on your phone and the settings on individual apps and see what permissions are allowed. It might be under, probably under settings and then under permissions, depending what kind of phone and operating system you have. And that's a great way to stop the absolute pervasive tracking by companies that have no damn business being knowing where you go or who your friends are. Excellent. Uh, I'm gonna revisit all of my apps tonight. Um, so listen, I'm not gonna give technical details on what you can do. I'm gonna say, so So what? I mean, we could all go home tonight and hide under our beds and throw our phones out the window and, and be paranoid the rest of our lives. Or we can try to figure out what is the balance between dealing with all of this and living our busy lives. Um, no matter what, this is. these are things that society is grappling with, and there's not all the right answers right now. That said, a few other things, not from necessarily the practical tips on how to deal with all of this, but just a few things to be aware of. Being as aware as you can of what is happening and what you are seeing in and of itself is already very important. To understand if I am looking at something and it is free, if I'm on an app and it is free, then how are they making money? That is the first most basic thing to think about. And if it is free and you are still reading it, listen, my weather app is free. I still look at the weather app every single morning so I know if it's gonna be raining or not. But if you, so one thing to think about is just to be aware. If you are on a social media site or even if you are in, on a news website and it is free, then just be extra aware of everything you're seeing. Is it coming to me the same way it's coming to everybody? Or is it possible I'm being a little bit manipulated into seeing one version of something? The second point to that is, it's great that everything's free, right? Otherwise we have to, but, but at the end of the day, if we want to combat some of this, we have to think through, are we willing to pay for journalism? Are we willing to pay for the news we read? At some point, it's a personal choice what that balance is. But third, I would also say, if these are issues that concern you, you don't have to be the expert in them and you don't have to know the details, but you can engage your representatives. You can call your congressperson and you can say, 
I don't, I am very concerned about what I am hearing in terms of data privacy, in terms of how I am tracked online, in terms of how social media platforms are affecting the elections. And you, as my representative, I hope that you are strongly considering the right legislation around that. You don't need to tell them what that legislation is. They, to use the word track, they track every time they get that phone call, every time they get that email. And if they know their constituents care, then they have to start thinking through it more. There's a whole array of bills out there to tackle a lot of these things. Some of them are very smart, some of them are not so smart. But it is important as an engaged citizen to be able to tell your representatives, I care about this. And as we have an election coming up, demand of the people you're considering voting for. I care about this, what is your stance on this? So that would be my broad, simple, comment. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, I was about to, to throw it out there. You mentioned that several days ago I saw um, an interview on TV with uh, Brad Smith, who is the president of Microsoft, and he wrote a book which is called um, Tools and Weapons. And he was talking exactly what you were saying. He said, in our country, we don't, and he said, mind you, president of Microsoft, right? He said that in our country, we don't have enough regulations um, to protect our privacy. And he said, um, in many industries, we, you know, there are regulations. For example, to give you an example, you go to the drugstore, you buy everything, you know, some medicine, and it's regulated, right? To a certain extent, right? Your privacy, your security. You, uh, you are on the plane. There is also a, a regulation, you know, for the safety of your flight, right? You have certain <laughs> right, um, but in uh, in cyberspace, it's like a wild, wild west. So basically, he talks a lot about it, and uh, it's a very, very interesting book. I looked at, um, actually on the reviews, and he writes about how this data center is working. For example, Microsoft has millions of data centers in 140 in countries. Apparently, it's a huge business. They make money on us every day. It's a huge business. <laughs> no, you're, you're absolutely right. right. And, about regulations and, the representatives. and again, that's why I said it, you don't necessarily, it's not up to every citizen to have a proposal on what legislation should look like. But it is up to us to say we want this from our government. And he says that in Europe there are more regulations than in the United States. Yep, yeah, this is true. Um, to I'm not the expert. So I want to make sure that we're taking a few different questions at the same time because I imagine there's overlaps. So we have one here and then one over here and then one here in front and then we'll come back to our panel. Okay. I have a very practical question. Um, I read an article a couple of weeks ago in New Yorker that was talking about how our cell phones are tracking us, particularly uh, the hardware tracking devices that are inside. So basically, what they were talking about was how, at any given moment, um, regardless if we have Android or Apple phone, and I'm sure most of us have smartphones in their pocket right now, all these corporations know exactly where we are in space. They can tell if we're on the first floor here and talking to you guys and listening to your software and data, or if we are upstairs in the restroom. And uh, there was a quote um, by one of the former Google um, executives saying, we know at any moment pretty much what you guys are thinking. <laughs> and that was, I don't want to be paranoid, but that really made me scared because I, imagine I want to, I don't want to participate in that system in which I'm, I'm surveilled, you know, there is surveillance on me every minute of my life. What can I what can I do? Should I really throw my phone out of the window, <laughs> or <laughs> is there any other way? Um, I heard about a company that's very different from um, Samsung and from Apple. It's called Purism. Um, they have a phone that basically does not track you. There's no hardware devices or software devices on the phone that are tracking you. But they have such a small share of the market. So if I, by default, have to have this cell phone in my pocket in order to operate in, the, in, in today's world, what can I do to start the tracking? Can I start the hardware tracking on me? Can I use 
Google Maps without being tracked, how, how does that work? Yeah. So a question about cell phone tracking and specifically um, and uh, about alternatives, right? So we have a question over here. Um, give us just a second to get the microphone sure, to you. No worries. Yeah. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, but my question goes back to what I think is the fundamental issue, which is legislation and law. Uh, if you look at this, you know better than I do, the history of uh, legislation or rules related to media was always after the fact, right? It took many years for print to come up with its rules, or advertising to come up with itself, quote unquote, print rules. As you know, cable was the Wild West, and the legislation we have for cable was actually crafted by three or four well-known names. And that is a fact. I was in this industry 35 years ago or 40 years ago, and I saw what was going on there. So my question to you guys and to your experts is, let's say the, the horse has left, right? The internet has leapfrogged any legislation uh, related to the pretty much uh, on a broader scale, right? Is there a, do you think, that the laws for the internet will be set by the actors, hmm. as has happened with other media. Uh, oh, sorry, whoever is, who cares? Yeah, I'm, I, I, have, I know, I have, mm -hmm. so if you want to take the answer, I have to go to another event. Um, yeah. But I can give a really quick thought on that, if you want. Yeah, well, we have a microphone moving, yeah. Okay, so just, I really apologize, I have to leave a little bit early. Um, you are correct that legislation will always be playing catch up. It doesn't mean I think that there is no potential to steer some of this ship back in a direction that it, it's, we are never gonna get legislation that is going to tackle every single one of these issues. It's gonna tell you exactly whether or not you can be tracked by your hardware, exactly how Facebook has to operate. But I do think there's some broader guardrails that many smart people are thinking through in terms of legislation. Um, I, I don't, I think it's very, I think there's a little bit of a self-serving talking point, especially for the Silicon Valley, to say it's too complicated, you're too late. I fundamentally disagree with that. That's one of the ways to get people to give up on trying to legislate in a smart way. Um, I won't go through every bill. There's some really interesting ones out there. I, I, it's complicated, but I don't think it's a lost cause. But will the actors serve the rules as they did in cable? We can return to that actually. We have a historian who will be remaining with us. So I want to give um, the opportunity to ask the last question and then we can address these because I, I do think there's a lot of really productive overlap here. So please. And a quick point of information. Um, the PBS News Hour recently had a person on who detailed how he, how it was possible to insert information somewhere that Hillary Clinton had this unknown bad disease. And I remember in 2016 in the election, I was thinking, wait a minute, I know from a really good source, Hillary Clinton has this disease. Now, how can we be more aware of this horrible type of thing? Excellent. So awareness, hardware, legislation. I, Helen, I know that you had some yeah, thoughts. I wanted to address the, the kind of one type of question, which is to say, how can we stop the phones from cracking us? How do we? And that the phones need to track us in order to know which cell tower to talk to. So the the, the phone needs to know that it's a, this spot in order to send a signal to the cell tower in order to function. So there's information that does need to flow in society. And I think all of us would support the idea that sharing information is a good thing and it helps society function. But the thing that's gone way off track is that there's absolutely no control over, and I don't mean each person controlling his or her own information, but there's no, we've lost a sense of what the correct constraints are on the sharing and the tracking and the flow of information. So when you're asking about regulation, the problem is, and I think Yael's perfectly correct, is who's managing the dialogue? And at the moment, I think the Silicon Valley companies 
are actually managing the dialogue. And we need to sit down and figure out like, what are the acceptable tracking that is productive to us and which it goes against the majority of our interests. That's, that's the discussion I think most of us want to have. But I agree that we, it's super important for all of us to express our interest in having something happen at the legislative, on the legislative agenda. Otherwise, we, we aren't going to be able to personally protect ourselves. Uh, that's my last <laughs> Jack, go ahead if you want to. Do you want to? Sure. I'll, I'll just say well, a few things quickly. So, um, <clears throat> I agree with what Alan and Neil said, the legislation is too important. Um, with respect to like the, the, the tech uh, CEO or whoever it was who said that we know what you're thinking before you know what you're thinking, I, if I wasn't representing Cornell, I'd use a swear here, but that's like, that's <laughs> not true. You know, I mean, they want to say that, that's a really great marketing pitch, but as scary as some of this sounds, uh, we should probably add the caveat that a lot of this stuff doesn't work very well. It doesn't work nearly as well as the companies who provide it think they do. Many of you probably have the experience of being followed, tracked, or you know, stalked across the internet by a specific product in an advertisement, sometimes after you've already bought it. So I mean, they, they, these companies don't know what they're doing. A lot of their data is junk. But other companies have bought into this idea that they can know what we're thinking before we do, and they're putting money into it. And what the result of this is that we're building this horrible ecosystem of tracking for a business that doesn't work in any case. It's not serving anybody, but the, but the few companies who are able to turn this, you know, uh, whatever this garbage is into gold by selling this myth. So that's one thing. Um, I think your question is about regulatory capture, the extent to which the politicians and organizations that are regulating industries are populated by people who come from those industries, and that's a huge problem. Um, I mean, the solution to it, I think, is, is again calling your representative and complaining about who's having influence over these sorts of issues, because I think that's Absolutely, the, the companies, big companies like Google, Facebook, and also the telecommunications companies that are tracking your phone, at and Comcast, and cable, and so on, they throw billions of dollars into lobbying Congress to try and create legislation that's gonna serve their interests, or to soften legislation to you know, blunt the force of it in ways that could harm the businesses seriously. I just I wanted to say something about Brad Smith, just a little plug for the Digital Life Initiative. He was one of our guests last year when his book, um, well he then he was talking about facial recognition, but he gave a public lecture in this room and um, I have to say that Brad Smith at Microsoft, a number of years ago, they sold off some of their targeted advertising platform. And I mean, none of these guys are perfect, so you know, take it with a, with a grain of salt. But, but they did wake up to the privacy concern quite, uh, quite early. And you also talked about artificial intelligence, which yes. is also unregulated. And I, for example, as a you know, private person, I'm not comfortable with that Facebook right now purchase WhatsApp, so all my day, they, they have everything to right. about right. it. And how, how is it possible? So I think we have time for one last question and then a, a quick recap from our panelists. Um, so, but please come ask us questions afterwards. Sorry. Are there any? potential international organizations concluded this is not a problem of the city of the state or even the country it's an international problem are there any such international actors that could take step up for this well they are there is um <clears throat> there are ngos so for example who are looking at particular issues so ai is one set of issues and um, I'm very active in, a, in an organization called GATEC, which is Electronic Privacy Information Center. And those NGOs are, are cross, work cross-nationally. And they, um, they, they try to engage, some countries are more op open to the possibility of regulation. So for example, in the United States, it's very hard to regulate because our politicians are beholden to the tech industry, whereas in other countries in Europe, less so. And so we try to um, create pressure from outside the US to, to 
you know, so, so there's a lot of, and of course at the global level, there's treaties and so forth, but, but a lot of this cross-national uh, uh, discussion is happening among NGOs. I do want to give a plug for thinking locally as well, though. We've seen a lot of big, um, big changes happening and big advances being made at the local level. We've mentioned the California state law that is affecting the way privacy might happen nationally. There has also been city level things, especially with regards to the use of facial recognition technologies or refusing the use of facial recognition technologies that are happening at the city level. So I, I think we have to be thinking across all these levels, internationally, nationally, but also think about locally. Think about how, especially in New York City, like if we can make it happen here, what, like where else can we affect it? So, and Roosevelt Island. Yeah, Roosevelt yeah, Island. Island, absolutely. Um, so I, I want to respect everybody's time here tonight, our panelists, but also our audience members. Um, we're out of time for the evening, but please do uh, come talk to us. Some of us are able to hang out afterwards. Um, if you had any questions we couldn't answer, I know we received some stuff about facial recognition and AI that we touched upon, but um, this is the first of many conversations, and, and we hope to continue this with you. Uh, so thank you to Jane, thank you to everyone here. Thank you. Thank you.